Hello everyone and welcome back. This is session two and before we begin I'd like to give you a quick overview of the couple items that you're going to learn during the course of this session. This session is dedicated to getting you used to the .NET command line interface. First, we'll discuss how do you can scaffold out a new .NET Core application using the .NET new command. There are several options available to you and I want to show you a different combination so you can get the experience that you expect at the command line. After creating a new application, we'll talk about some of the most commonly used .NET commands. These include running your application, building your application, adding packages, adding project references, and more. Then we'll change gears and we'll move over to a tool called Yeoman. And Yeoman is a code generation tool that's used heavily by the Node.js community and also in other development areas. We will use it to scaffold out a new ASP.NET Core application that we'll then use for the last part of our session. A common question I get when working within Linux is how can Windows and Linux talk to each other? Or how can Windows, Mac, and Linux all talk to each other? I want to show you that workflow. So we'll push our code up into a GitHub repository, move over to a Windows machine, and pull it down. Let's get started. One of the first major hurdles you're going to have to jump over is that because we're not working inside of Visual Studio, how do we create a brand new application from the start? Well, at the command line, when you have .NET installed properly in Linux, we have access to the .NET command. And everything that we're going to do in this session is through the .NET command. So I can type .NET new. And .NET new isn't going to do anything except give me some help information. What's worth noting in this list is that there's several templates that I can choose from. Console applications, class libraries, these aren't different from how you would use them inside of Visual Studio. I have unit testing, and I have ASP.NET Core basic applications. Whether I want just an empty web app, I want a standard web app with a little bit of Chrome built into it, or if I'm building an API and I just need the stuff for building web API based applications. To use any of these, all we need to do is type .NET new and the name of the template we want to use. For example, I want to create a new MVC based application. The .NET new command will generate it in the current application directory that I'm in. And let's take a look at this inside of the Visual Studio code. Now, everything we need to build out a very simple ASP.NET MVC application is here. Inside of my startup CS, I already have my hooks in for adding my MVC dependencies. And I'm already taking care of setting up the MVC route tables. I already have a default controllers view that has a home controller inside of it with my index about and contact and error pages. If you've built default ASP.NET applications in Visual Studio, this should look fairly similar. If I go back into the command line, I can run this application by saying .NET run, and my application is listening on port 5000. The great thing about the sample of MVC application is it gives you links also to different documentation pages that will teach you how to do new and exciting things in ASP.NET Core. Another scenario you might want to consider is what if I want to build a new MVC application, but instead of C Sharp, I want to use F Sharp. Our command line starts pretty much the same way. .NET new MVC application, but I'm also going to add a language attribute that says F sharp. This will generate a new ASP.NET Core web app that targets F sharp instead of C sharp. If we open it in Visual Studio Code, we'll see that instead of a startup CS file, I now have a startup FS file that still injects MVC and uses MVC. We can see my controllers have been rebuilt 
to use F sharp methods. Another common option when building out MVC based applications is the ability to set authentication. That's no different with the templates that are provided by the .NET command line interface. If at the command line I type .NET new MVC and use the attribute AU for authentication, I can tell .NET Core I would like no authentication or I can use individual user accounts. The sample inside of Visual Studio Code will show me that my application is scaffolded to use ASP.NET Identity out of the box, which means that's one less thing that I have to configure on my end. You might have noticed in the previous samples that whenever I created a new application, it was created in the current directory that I was in. There might be use cases where you want to create a new directory automatically and scaffold the application within that directory. Well, we can do that using the output attribute. If I build my new MVC application and use the attribute O and tell it to please build a new application within the foobar folder, the .NET new command will set that up for me. So now I can open up Visual Studio Code inside of foobar instead of in my current working directory. Now, now this is really helpful when you want to create different types of application layers that all work together. For example, if I create a new .NET new class library, I'll create it in the var foo folder. So here I have two different application layers. First, foobar is my first foobar is my web layer. It contains my MVC application. And then I have bar foo, which is my class layer. So this could be a data layer, it could be a business layer, it could be some sort of additional dependency that you need to have within your application. It's time to learn a couple new commands. Inside of one of our folders, we're going to do a .NET restore. Now .NET restore will read the csproj file of your application, look at all the dependencies or NuGet dependencies that have been set, and it will go download those dependencies accordingly. If you're running your application inside of Visual Studio Code, it will make a point to correct you if you forget to restore your dependencies. The last most common command you'll use with .NET Core is going to be .NET Build and .NET Run. Now we've seen .NET Build a couple times before. This will take the current working folder and build the csproj file that's inside of it. If it has any dependencies, it will build those dependencies as well. A small thing to notice is that this application is built in debug mode. In cases of release or production, you'll want to change that to release mode and get the benefit of the release time optimizations that .NET Core will take care of for you. We can do that by saying .NET build C release. That tells .NET Core that it should build the release mode version of this application. And the final most useful command you'll use on a regular basis is .NET Run, which we have already seen a couple of times before. This will run the current application that you're looking at. If it needs to be built or any dependencies need to be rebuilt, .NET Core will take care of doing that for you. As you progress through your application development, 
you'll have a need to install new packages from NuGet. Now there are a couple different ways that you can accomplish this. The first way is using the command line. So I could type .NET add package and provide it the name of a package that I would like to install, such as Newtonsoft JSON or JSON.NET. When I do this, .NET Core will go out to NuGet, download the appropriate files and dependencies for Newtonsoft JSON for JSON.NET, and it will install them on my disk and also add a reference to my foobar.csproj file. If I take a moment and open my csproj file inside of my editor, I can see I have a new package reference all set and ready to go. Uh, by default, add package will take the current latest non-beta version of package. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you use the add package command, .NET Core will also take into account what your target framework is for your current application. In this example, I'm using .NET Core App 1.1, uh, but there are cases where you might be targeting .NET Core 1.0. And if you were sticking to a Windows only environment or trying to use Mono, then this could be .NET Framework 4.6. Maybe you have a use case where you have installed a package and you would like to remove it. We can remove it by saying .NET remove package Newtonsoft JSON. And now my package is gone from my listing. Now adding or removing packages from a single project is fine, but you might run into cases where you need to link to another existing library that you have already built. In our example, we have foobar, which is our web application. And then we have barfoo, which is our class library. And what I would like to do is add a reference to barfoo, the class library, inside of foobar. And I can do that using the .NET command. I can tell .NET to add to foobar a reference bar foo slash bar foo CS proj. If I now open up Visual Studio Code inside the foobar folder, It shows me that I have a project reference to barfu inside my application. Now if I go in the foobar and I type .NET build, because I have a reference to the barfu class library, .NET will automatically compile that first before it compiles foobar. It's just like inside of Visual Studio where the editor takes care of managing your project references for you. One thing to keep in mind is to make sure that your dependencies have all their references installed. For example, if barfoo is loaded on my disk, but I have not done a .NET restore inside of it, I might run into several build time errors because it can't find appropriate dependencies. As a recap, I'd like to review the couple commands that we showed during the course of that demo. The first is the .NET new command. And when you're using .NET new, the simplest thing you can do is just type .NET new and the .NET command line interface will provide you with a list of installed templates. Your list of templates will depend on the current installed version of your SDK. Some examples of templates that you could use include MVC, class for class libraries, or web API to build out an API. These templates are designed to give you the minimum that you need to get up and running. There are a couple additional command line arguments that you can use to build out your application a little bit more customized. First, if you're building an MVC or web application, you can use the AU command line argument. By providing the value none or individual, you're telling the .NET template generator that you would like to not use authentication or you want to use authentication. The command line argument lang for language 
lets you specify whether you want your application to be in C Sharp or in F Sharp. As more languages are supported by the .NET command line interface, you'll have additional options available. And finally, we showed the O argument, which allows you to dictate the output directory of your application. If you leave this off, the default directory is the current directory that you're inside of. So make sure that you set it if you don't want all your code to get mixed inside of each other. We showed the .NET restore command. Now, every application that you build with .NET Core will have a CS proj file or a FS proj file. And these proj files dictate resources that you want to pull down from inside of NuGet. By saying .NET restore, we're telling the .NET command line to please go to NuGet and download the appropriate versions of our dependencies. It's also worth noting that if you move between different platforms, you'll have to run .NET Restore every single time to ensure you're getting the correct version of your dependencies. We discussed additional commands for adding and removing NuGet packages at the command line. If I type .NET add package and provide a package name for a package that exists inside of NuGet, the .NET command line interface will go download that package for me. Additionally, it will update my CS proj file to make sure that I have a current reference to that package name. That way, when I push my CS proj file into source control and it's pulled down by other developers, if they were to run .NET Restore on their own boxes, the .NET command line interface would pull down appropriate versions for them. And finally, if I use .NET Remove Package with the appropriate package name, the .NET command line interface will remove the package from my disk and also from my CS or FS proj files. And sometimes you have references that aren't in NuGet. So these might be additional projects on your disk or it might be references that you want to link to separately. If I use the .NET add reference command and provide it a link to a CS proj file somewhere on my disk, then .NET will automatically update my CS proj file of my current application to reference this new project. It will also set up a dependency link, so if I try to build my current project, it will build the other CS proj files first. That way, I always have the latest version of my code at build time. Now I want to show you how to scaffold out a new .NET application using a tool called Yeoman. In the last session, I showed you how to install Node.js as it would be a dependency for this particular session. If you didn't already, go back and install Node.js, and once you have everything configured, make sure that you have Yeoman installed by typing in npm install g yo. You can safely ignore any warnings that you see during this process. If everything is installed correctly, the Yeoman doctor will run a check of your system to ensure that Yeoman can run without any major issues. When Yeoman is ready to go, then you'll want to also install npm install g generator asp.net. Yeoman by itself does not physically generate code for you. Yeoman works by installing generators, and these generators, given certain scenarios, can generate code on your behalf. This one, the generator-asp.net package, is managed and maintained by core folks on the ASP.NET team and also various members of the community. One final piece you'll have to have installed for some certain scenarios is npm install bower. And Bower is a client-side library management system. Common use cases for Bower are installing different packages such as jQuery, Bootstrap, and others. Certain parts of a generator might require tools that only can be provided through Bower. Once you have these three dependencies all set up and they're working correctly, we can run Yeoman by simply saying yo ASP.NET. Once we have all these pieces working, we can generate a new ASP.NET Core application by simply saying yo ASP.NET. 
and this will load the ASP.NET Core generator. Now, as you can notice, the options on the screen are very similar to the options I would give with the .NET Core command line. I can scroll down. I have web applications. I have web applications with basic authentication, web API. I also have Nancy-based applications, class apps, unit testing, and more. If I were to choose an application, for example, web application without authentication, Yeoman will ask me what type of UI framework I would like to use. In my case, I like to use Bootstrap. I have to give my application a name, which I'll just leave the default web application basic. And Yeoman will automatically scaffold out the entire app on my behalf. Now it's worth noting here that I do get a slight error because I do not have Git installed on this particular machine. That's okay, that's a very quick fix using the sudo apt-git install git command. And within a couple of seconds, I should have git installed on my machine. Now inside my web application basic folder, I have a couple of small commands I should run. First, I should run the bower install command. And this will read my bower JSON file and like I said before, it's used to install different client-side based libraries, such as Bootstrap, jQuery, and also in this case, things like jQuery validation. Then I can type .NET restore to install everything inside of my chproj file, which was generated on my behalf. And finally, .NET run or .NET build before it, uh, but because I'm running this for the first time, the application will be built for me. One issue that you might run into a couple of times when you use Yeoman or if you're pulling code off the internet from different repositories is if you try to run that application and you don't have the same version of the .NET Core framework installed that the particular project is expecting, the .NET library will come back and tell you that it's expecting a different version of your framework. So here, the error is telling me that it's expecting version 1.04 of my framework, but I only have 1.1.1 installed. Now at the time, 1.1.1 is the current installed version that you can pull from Microsoft's website. This Yeoman generator is still dependent on an older version of the SDK. If you run into this issue, you can make a quick fix by going into Visual Studio Code, opening your csproj file, and making sure that your target framework is .NET Core App 1.1, not 1.0. If you go back to the command line after this fact and run .NET Restore again, the reason we have to run .NET Restore again is because I've changed my framework version, meaning there might be a use case where .NET Core needs to install different packages based off of the framework that I'm targeting. If everything works out well, I can now say .NET Run, and this should work without any errors. And we have success my ASP.NET Core application is running just the same way it would if I had ran .NET New, except this time it's run with a Yeoman generator. For our next set of demos, we want to consider a situation of being a true cross-platform application developer. And even though you've been enlightened and moved all your application development to Linux or to Mac, your Windows colleagues might not have had the same realization. How do we take the work we've been doing in ASP.NET Core and make that so someone working inside of Windows can build our projects without any additional effort? So here on the screen, I have my web application that I had built in the previous demo, and I'm going to swap over to GitHub where I've created an empty repository, uh, AWW uh, ASP.NET without Windows. And 
I haven't put anything into it yet because I want to show you kind of the step-by-step -step process that I would take putting this up in the GitHub, moving over to a Windows machine, pulling it down, and trying to open it inside of Visual Studio. The best part about creating a new repository inside of GitHub is that they give you the instructions on how to perform your first commit to a new repository. The first step is to initialize the Git repository with git init. Then we have to add all the files that are in the current directory into the Git repository. If I use git status, I will get a list of every file that is going to get added. One of the major benefits of using Yeoman that we didn't talk about in the last section was that it will generate a git ignore file on your behalf. Git ignore is really useful because inside of our web application basic folder, we have certain files and folders that we don't want to commit up in the source control. For example, I have my bin and my object fo folders. These contain compiled references that are really only good on this system. If I were to push these up into source control and then pull them down another system, they wouldn't have any meaning because the system would have to be rebuilt all over again. So it's better just to leave them outside of source control. Once I have everything added to Git, I need to do a git commit. This takes all the pending files that I have added for changes within the Git repository and it commits them. Once I have everything ready to go, then I can do a git push up into my master. And if I refresh my GitHub page, we'll see that all my code is up and ready to go. I'm now going to switch over to a Windows machine. And on this Windows machine, I'm going to go git clone the directory that I just pushed up into GitHub. Now there are two things that we're going to want to look at while we're in here. First, let me cd into that directory and we'll see all my files are exactly where I expect them to be. Now I already have the latest version of the .NET Core SDKs and runtime on, on this box. So if I type .NET restore, .NET restore will look at the csproj file that's in my application and it will pull all the appropriate dependencies down. Next, if I type .NET build, the .NET Core executable will look at my CS proj and build the application accordingly. And finally, if I say .NET run, I see my application is up and running on port 5000. And if I switch over to a web browser, I can see my application up and running. And I know what you're thinking. Kevin, that's great, but that still keeps me at the command line. My coworkers are used to using Visual Studio. Is there a way that they can use that csproj file and my entire application stack inside of Visual Studio and not have to use the command line? And you are absolutely right. That's something that we need to look at. Now, as of this recording, you have to use Visual Studio 2017, which was just released a couple weeks ago. This is the only version that supports the csproj file in its current state. If I go to open a new solution, go into my web basic application csproj file and open it. We'll see my entire project loads up appropriately and it's automatically taking care of a package restore on my behalf. I can perform a build of this application 
and I can start it up just like I normally would with any other Visual Studio app. And we see my new application is up and running. So there you have it. That is a very straightforward demo of going from one platform to another because of the benefits we get from .NET Core. Now we've spent a lot of time over the past two hours talking about what ASP.NET Core is, how it all fits together, but we haven't spent too much time building a real application. And that's what I like to start doing now is let's walk through the process of building an ASP.NET Core app from scratch pretty much. And I'm inside my console. I'm going to show you that there's nothing inside of this. So we're starting from absolute scratch. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a new directory called math API. And what I like to do is create a small sample app that uses some of the same concepts that I would use building a real ASP.NET application. So we're going to have a web app and we're going to have some sort of business library um, off to the side. And we're going to link the two together and we're going to build them all separately. So inside of Math API, I'm going to use Yeoman to do all my generation. I'm going to select a new ASP.NET app. And I'm going to create an empty web application because I want to start everything from scratch. What are we going to call it? I'm going to call mine mathapi.web. And it's all built out. Now, also while I'm here, I'm going to create another Yeoman project. And we'll generate a class library. And this class library will be mathapi.library. So both the web project and the library is sitting here. Okay. Let's open up Visual Studio Code. All right, so with Visual Studio Code opened up, let's uh, let's start with our web project. Inside of our web project, I'm going to take a very quick look at our CS proj file. And the first thing I like to do is make sure my target framework is hitting the correct version of the .NET Core SDK. Uh, I will also have to go into my library project and perform the same function. We want to make sure this is pointing to 1.6, which is the latest and greatest. Uh, the Yeoman generator should update in the future. So just do a quick check there. If you forget to do it, you're going to hit a pretty obvious error. We will save those out. And then we'll come into our math API project. Let me just run this from absolute scratch. So we'll go into mathapi.web. We'll do a .NET restore because we need to make sure everything gets pulled down appropriately. And then we'll say .NET run. And my application is started up. So if we open this in a new browser, it's localhost port 5000 and hello world. Awesome. Well, we're not going to leave that there. We'll shut down our application and switch back over to Visual Studio Code. Now, we want this to be an ASP.NET MVC application because I want to build an API that can take some simple math equations and return responses. Well, step one is I need to add the appropriate package to my application. And there's a couple ways I can add it. I'm going to show you from the command line because I think that's kind of the easiest way. You can also hand alter the CS proj file. But at the command line, let me go ahead and clear my screen. We'll say .NET add package. And the package name we're looking for is Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC. And this downloads successfully. And one of the great things that 
NuGet does for me automatically is that it will update my package references. So I make sure I have the current version of ASP.NET Core MVC. Next, I need to configure my application to use ASP.NET Core MVC. Uh, and Visual Studio Code is jumping in here. It's telling me, hey, I don't have all the assets to do proper building or debugging inside of Visual Studio Code. Uh, that's fine. Let me hit yes. Let it set itself up. Uh, it's also telling me it needs to go resolve all the dependencies in the CS proj files. That just is a fancy way of Visual Studio Code asking me, can it do a .NET restore on my behalf? And in both these cases, I'm fine. You notice down in the bottom, it's doing the .NET restore for me. But we'll go ahead and close that out because we don't need it. Now to set up ASP.NET Core MVC, I have to first inject the appropriate services into the ASP.NET pipeline. And then I need to tell the request handler how to handle MVC style requests. So in configure services, this is pretty straightforward. Services add MVC. That's all, nothing special. And then down in configure, I'm gonna tell my app to use MVC. And I'm going to remove the app.run because I don't want the default handler in there anymore. And there we go. MVC is set up with all the defaults that we could ask for. Uh, the only default that we don't have is a default route handler. So I'll have to be very specific with my routes here in a couple minutes. But MVC is up and running. Let's go back into our web project and we'll create a new folder called controllers. And under controllers, we'll create a controller called math controller. And now I have the fun job of scaffolding out a math controller. Um, I'm not going to make you sit through this, so I'm going to code very quickly and then we'll come back and talk through what the code does. I'm gonna pause here for a second to show you another Visual Studio Code trick. Notice uh, it can't resolve controller because it doesn't know the appropriate namespace. But I get resharper like syntax highlighting here. So I can tell Visual Studio Code, I mean that it should set up a using statement for MVC. So now any future calls that it's not sure about, it'll be sure to look inside of that using statement first. All right, let's move on. All right, I'm going to slow down here for a moment and kind of show you what I got and talk through it. Now, this isn't totally uh, functional. It's just enough to get the scaffold and then we'll go in and we'll fill in the blanks. So I already showed you creating a new controller, bringing in or inheriting from the controller base class. Awesome. I've set up four different actions. And if you're not that familiar with ASP.NET MVC, that's okay. I, I'm hoping that this scaffold kind of shows you the basics. Uh, four methods, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. When I call into one of these methods, I'm going to pass in two numbers, a number one and a number two. And given the values of these numbers, I'm going to I'm going to do whatever the action is. So add, subtract, multiply, or divide. 
in the way that MVC knows that it should call any of these one particular methods is based off the HTTP verb, in this case, a get request. So I should be able to do it just from the browser. Uh, and then the route. So if my fully qualified route name is localhost port 5000 add five and five, that should return 10. Um, I know it's not the most scientific uh, demo in the world, but it kind of gets a couple points across. So let's do a very quick test to see if this works. I'm going to change a couple of my contents here and I'm going to press F5 inside of Visual Studio Code because what this should do is build the project and run and debug it all inside of Visual Studio Code. All right, I don't have a default landing page for the index default route. That's fine. I'm going to go back into Visual Studio Code and show you I'm currently debugging. I'm going to add a breakpoint to a couple of my line. So line 24 and line 31. So now let's do a test. If I go to slash add five and five, I've hit a breakpoint in Visual Studio Code. If I mouse over the different variables, I can see that I have five and five. It's just like Visual Studio. I have all the IntelliSense that I would normally expect in these cases. So that's cool. Let's uh, let's hit play. It should return back zero. All right. So I know that doesn't mean much because we're not actually adding anything. Let's uh, subtract. I hit a breakpoint again. Again, five and five. We'll play through and returns one. So I know I'm in a different method. So cool. Let's uh, let's stop debugging. And let's take this a step further. I want to make sure that when I call uh, into these add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions, I want to pass this out to another library. Uh, because it's a good idea to make sure you're actions or your controllers in general are pretty thin they shouldn't perform major work the, themselves that's why we have another class library so i'll go into my library function we'll open up class one which is not going to stay named class one we'll just call this uh math actions or you know what we'll call it math service I get a special IntelliSense pop-up here that says, hey, your class is named math service, but your file name is called class one. Uh, this is normally something ReSharper would do for you. I want to rename the file. And then inside of math service, I'm going to add four methods. Uh, the first method is add number one and then number two. Uh, I'm going to go through again and scaffold this out real quickly so you don't have to watch me type. All right, here we go. We're completely formatted. I have four methods, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Uh, they both take two parameters, number one and number two, and then we add them together, we subtract them, we multiply them, and we divide them. The only big difference in this extraction is that for divide, I return a double. That way I don't lose my floating point um, stuff when I divide two integers together. Uh, so awesome. Now I need to go link my math api library into math api web so i can use all those different methods so let's go back out to terminal let's clear up 
and I'm going to go into mathapi.web. And I'm going to use the .NET add reference command to add mathapi library. I'm going to add math API library CS proj. So now inside of Visual Studio Code, if I look at the CS proj file one more time, I now have a project reference. Awesome. Let's do one more thing. When you use different services in your controllers. There's a couple different ways to do it, but ideally you don't want to new up a version of your math service every single time. So I could say var service is equal to math API library math service. And then I could use service dot add to add the numbers together. But that's not the best approach uh, for these type of applications because that creates a very, uh, that creates a coupled uh, dependency to that particular instance of math service. So I wanna show you how to do an injection instead because ASP.NET Core is designed from the very beginning to harness dependency injection. And I'd like to show you how to take advantage of that. If I go over into my startup CS file, I'm going to add a new line in configure services called add scoped. Uh, and what that means is I would like to tell ASP.NET Core that if I ever request an instance of math service, it should create a new version of that that is scoped specifically for that call. I can also create other types of injections such as uh, transient or singletons uh, that have different rules within the application. But for most of my purposes, I use add scope because I just want an instance of this for one particular call. Once I've added this line, I can go back into my controller, go up to the very top, and I'm going to create a new controller. And I'll add a dependency called math service. And code doesn't know what I'm talking about, so I'll add my library. I'll save it off as a field. And I'll let Visual Studio Code do the rest. So now, anytime this controller is instantiated, which would happen on any one request into the application, I want to create a new instance of my math service and then use it where necessary. So I'll say service dot add number one and number two. And we have some we need to make a couple small adjustments because the results going to come back as an integer. I'm just going to write that result out as uh, as a string. So we'll say result nothing fancy. And let's go do a test real quickly and make sure this all works. We'll hit F5 again. And inside the browser, I'll type add. We'll just add a couple numbers together, 10 and 20. That should hit my breakpoint, which my result has already run. The answer is 30. And we'll write that out to the screen. Awesome. So my result, 30, that's all, that's all coming back. Now, real fast. I'll stop debugging, Let's clean up a little bit of my windows. I'm going to refactor this application for subtract, multiply, and divide. All 
Alright, I think I'm good to go. I'm going to go ahead and remove my breakpoints so I don't hit those again. Uh, let's hit F5 one more time. And let's uh, let's do another test. So I already did add. Let's try subtract. Let's say I have 50 and let's subtract 20. It returns 30. Awesome. Well, what about multiply? All right. Awesome. 50 times 20 is 1,000. And then let's do something that's a little even. I'll say 50 divided by 2. That returns the wrong number. All right. Obviously, I have a problem. Let's see what my problem is. So inside divide... Let me go into my math service. We'll go down to divide. Oh, it's because I'm multiplying by two numbers instead of dividing. This is why you should not copy and paste, kids. Let's uh, restart this one more time. And let's try one more time. All right, 50 divided by 2 is 25. I got the legit answer. Now, what happens if I type something that's not uh, quite even? So, 49 set it to well, I get 24 so my, I, I have a slight issue with my floating point that's okay um, we'll go back and we'll fix that in the next section where we talk about unit testing because this is something I should be testing for is are my results returning the appropriate responses and this is a case where it's not so we'll stop here this is a great introduction into building out an ASP.NET Core application kind of from scratch. And I know this is an API. We're not rendering full views of HTML or any of that good stuff. Uh, but that's okay. This is just, these are building blocks. Um, in the next section, we'll talk about unit testing and more hopefully automated use unit testing where I can just say .NET test and it runs all my unit tests for me. So I can grab little issues like this where 49 divided by 2 is not really 24. It's uh, some point value. How do we catch that? Uh, how do we make sure that we don't have that problem again in the future? Uh, then finally, we'll talk about deployment. And I'll wrap up with a couple final thoughts. So thanks, everyone. I'll see you in the next section.